Welcome to Recalculating Small Business. Like its award-winning book, Recalculating is dedicated to small business in America. Your hosts are Don Mazella and Dan Perkins. Don Mazella is the editor-in-chief of the Small Business Digest. Dan Perkins is a registered investment advisor with 43 years experience in managing money. Dan Perkins here, your co-host along with Don Mazella of Recalculating for Small Business. Our radio program is dedicated to you, helping the small business owners increase their profits. We draw our name from Recalculating, voted the best small business book of 2017 by the Independent Press. In this book, it features ways to grow your small business. Now, here's Don Mazzella. Dan, entrepreneurs come in many shapes and sizes, and along with their products, they're often different. Joe Kudla is into shorts. He's here to tell us about that, how he got into the business, and all about it, uh, where his company is going now and in the future. Joe, welcome to Recalculating Radio. Ed, thank you so much for having me, guys. Well, first, Joe, t- uh, tell us a little bit about your background, then we'll talk about your product. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of my friends say I've lived nine lives, but... Um, I was a competitive athlete growing up. I played football and lacrosse and really any physical sport that I could get involved with. And um, then I went on to University of San Diego uh, where I studied accounting and played lacrosse. Uh, Graduated from there with an accounting degree and uh, went of all places to Europe. And I did some modeling for a couple of years, traveling the world. And that was really my first introduction to the world of fashion and apparel. Um, I came back and got back into finance and accounting and started a career at Ernst & Young. And then uh, in my mid-20s, kind of started my adventure into entrepreneurship with a, a staffing and recruiting business. Um, and then uh, about five years ago, um, I saw an opportunity in uh, the men's activewear market. And uh, that, that's what led me on this path to create Viore. Well, what was the opportunity you saw before we go any further? Yeah, well, you know, so I got into yoga um, about 10 years ago because a friend suggested it would be really healing for my back. I was dealing with some bad back problems. And, um, you know, the question that led me on this path was, what did guys wear to yoga? <laughs> and there, there just were not a lot of options available to us. And um, the mainstream kind of activewear brands that I grew up with competing in sports weren't really paying attention to the category. But, you know, when you looked at the demos, there was over 17 million people practicing yoga in the United States. And 30% of them were men. And so we thought, wow, that's, that's a lot of guys without any brands kind of giving them any attention. Um, and we thought, we realized it was the fastest growing um, kind of demographic within yoga participation. So as a surfer, you know, I knew that there was only 2 million people that surfed in the United States. And you think about how many apparel brands there are servicing that customer. So we just did the, the simple math and said, Hey, there's, there's a, there's a unique opportunity here. Well, we go before we go any further. What is your website and the name of your company? So the name of the company is Viori with a V, and uh, the website is VioriClothing dot com, and Viori is spelled V U O R I. And how did you come up with that name? So Viori means mountain in Finnish. And um, I like to dabble in mountaineering. I, I climb mountains in my spare time. And um, mountain is also kind of a foundational pose in yoga that, that a lot of the other poses are built from. So it had a dual meaning to us that was really relevant. And, and we just liked the way it looked and felt. Okay. I'm going to ask a one, one or two more questions and turn it over to Dan. But what is so unique about your shorts? Well, we saw a unique opportunity in men's athletic shorts. Um, partly because, you know, a lot of the brands that were out there were, were making product that, quite quite frankly, you know, we just didn't want to wear. Uh, we're from the beaches of Southern California. And if you were looking at kind of what was happening in the, the broader athletic market, the mainstream mass brands were being distributed at mass retail, you know, Sports Authority, Dick's Sporting Goods, and so forth. Um, and they were really competing on price more than anything. Then you have Lululemon, which entered the picture, and Lululemon was really focused on their female consumer, but they were making products at a much higher quality, better construction, more tailored, modern athletic fits, 
and it was working really well, and they were charging a lot more for those products, quite frankly, just because they cost it all, they cost a lot more to make. Um, but it was working, and they defined and created this category. The, the problem for me and, and my group of friends was that Lululemon just always felt like our girlfriend or our wife's brand. It was just a, it had a feminine name. The shopping experience was really more tailored towards women. And we thought, hey, we're surfers. We're from the beaches of Southern California. Why doesn't anybody make a similar quality product to Lulu? So go way upscale in terms of um, construction materials and fit, but deliver a product that has a more casual DNA or aesthetic that guys can not only wear to the gym, but you actually want to wear outside of the gym as well. So versatility becomes a really important part of, of what we're creating. And we like to stay built to move in, styled for life as kind of our guiding ethos when it comes to making products. So I think that's really the differentiating factor for Viore. So um, uh, as I understand it, your your product, uh, your shorts um, are tighter to the uh, to the body and uh, hence absorb the um, uh, the sweat, et cetera, better and are more comfortable. Is that well, how I understand it? I think that's fair. I mean, I'm a I'm an athletic guy. I have big quads, and, and they fit my legs fine. So they're not designed to be tight to the legs. I don't want to convey that we're designing, like, yoga clothing that's like, like a women's yoga pant or anything to that effect. These are, these are really casual shorts. And I think the biggest differentiator is the way that they look. You know, everything we make has the same – same materials as the best athletic apparel on the market. But when you look at it, you might confuse it for a board short or a swim trunk. You know, we're using like very sophisticated prints. Um, the color story is really wearable. We're not doing a ton of brights. Um, and it's just really wearable. I think guys love the fact that they can wear them to work out in and then they can wash them and go take them and meet a friend for lunch or, um, you know, do something totally unactive in those, in those same shorts. And, and I think that's the, the, the recipe that's, that's defined our brand. Well, I have a lot more questions, but I'm going to turn it over to Dan at this point. Well, Joe, I mentioned in the pre-show that I live on an island in southwest Florida out in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, we moved here full-time about three years ago. And I would say um, – you could probably count on one hand the number of times on this island in three years that I've ever worn big boy pants. I live in shorts. They're comfortable. Uh, You're right, the fabrics. I, I, I don't know whether there's an outlet for your shorts here, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, it just feels much more comfortable wearing shorts than the long pants. So let's talk about Absolutely. your product. How do you distribute your product? So three primary um, channels of distribution. When we launched the business, we were forced to think of it as a direct-to-consumer only business because, quite frankly, the wholesale accounts didn't really want anything to do with us. Um, There was a broad trend happening called athleisure, quote-unquote, and and I hate using that word, but I'm going to use it. And women's brands were taking full advantage of it. Um, The men's brands were later to catch on, but the the broader wholesale market – was just trying to figure out how do I address this athleisure trend for women and how do I merchandise that in my store? They weren't ready for men's at the time that we were introducing the brand. So we knew that we would have to go and build that relationship directly with the customer. And so we did that via our website, vreclothing.com. And we still, that's one of our largest points of distribution um, still to this point. Um, about a year into our business, we opened our first flagship retail store here in our, in our backyard of Encinitas and, more recently, we've opened a store in Los Angeles, and we're looking to open one in San Francisco. We're going to continue to open in key markets across the United States. Um, and then the last channel, which was late to adopt, um, but we knew would always be important to us, was wholesale. Um, REI was a, a great early partner, so we're distributed nationally, both men's and women's, with REI. Um, Nordstrom is a great partner of ours. Um, uh, Core Power Yoga, Equinox. Um, to name a few kind of more gyms and yoga studios, but we're, we're sold in about 650 wholesale um, partners across the United States. So at this point, I guess you'd call us an omni channel business. So where, where is your merchandise manufactured? 
um, predominantly in Asia. You know, we do some in the United States. We do some in South America. Um, but the lion's share is in Asia. And that's predominantly because they just make the best quality product. You know, they are a, they're experts in apparel, especially when it comes to technical construction. All the best performance fabrications in the country come from Asia, um, Taiwan, Japan, um, and China. And so um, that's, that's where we are making most of our product now. So help our entrepreneur listeners who uh, uh, listen to the show and, and download uh, quite extensively. What was it like when you had this great concept for this new line of apparel uh, of trying to find a relationship with somebody in Asia to manufacture your product? Well, that's a great question. And, um, you know, for us, it, it, you know, it was a little bit easier, um, partly because early on I partnered with a designer that had been making apparel in our category for 20 plus years. And she brought with her a lot of great experience, uh, great relationships with factories. So what, what I would pass on to your listeners, um, is that there's just a lot of ways of getting creative with networking that you can get that type of information. There, there wasn't a central kind of database or software platform or website where we could go and just identify all the best factories in the world. Um, what I would do, and still to this day when we're interested in entering a new category where we don't have experiences, you know, I'll, I'll just get onto LinkedIn, look at other professionals that have experience in product development or manufacturing, and, um, and I'll just reach out. And typically people are pretty open in terms of sharing that information um, with fellow entrepreneurs and folks that are looking to grow their business. Joe, I was at a conference this morning uh, on trade. And um, the subject matter came up about intellectual property uh, and the risk of manufacturing in the, this morning's discussion was China and South Korea. Um, do you do you have any evidence that your designs or your products been pirated and sold someplace else? We don't have any evidence that our products have been. Um, pirated or sold in other markets. Um, we're, we're still relatively early stage um, as a company, but I know that we've had some trademark infringement in China with some um, different factories that have registered to um, get our marks, um, get protection for our marks in their market. And so we've had to, to unfortunately go through the, the legal process of, of um, kind of working that out. Um, but but no, we're fortunate to not have any kind of bootlegged or, or pirated product in the market at this point that we're aware of. The battle that you had over your trademark in China was it expensive to do that? Yeah, in our case, um, fortunately, um, the folks that had registered it um, didn't ever really do anything with it, so it was a relatively um, inexpensive um, process. But you know, for an early stage company. You know, it still costs legal fees, and, and it's not something that you want to be spending your time on. So it was definitely a distraction. Right. But, um, we're, we're, we're fortunate that we didn't have to go deep down the rabbit hole. So you've been, you've been doing this for about five years, I think you said? That's correct, yeah. What, uh, what's been your growth? Uh, it's been pretty incredible. You know, I was just chatting with somebody earlier today about – you know, how when you build an investor deck, you know, you put down projections that are going to get people's attention and obviously things that you think are achievable um, at, at the same time. But I think in every entrepreneur's kind of, uh, you know, in the, in, at some part in their mind, they're a little bit worried, you know, will we actually hit these numbers? These numbers are aggressive. And, you know, when we look back to that initial deck that we presented, we're far exceeding all of our projections. And, you know, even – in year when we only, you know, when you're looking 12 months out, we continue to reforecast up. So um, just to kind of give you, I, I'm not going to share revenue numbers, but to give you kind of uh, a, a general idea, you know, we grew 140% last year. You know, this year we're projecting 160%. We were projecting originally 125%, but we've upped our forecast to 158. So, 
you know, the business is just firing on all cylinders. You know, we're, we're growing extremely fast. You know, we're up 304%. If you just look at the first six months of 2018, um, where we'll close out this June, we'll be up 304% over the same period last year. E-commerce will be up almost 100%. And, um, you know, our retail store at about 56%. So, you know, we're, we're just seeing very dynamic growth. And I think it's a testament not only to um, the category um, that we're in with there being such a focus on health and wellness in the United States, but, um, you know, also just a testament to, to us kind of redefining what athletic and, and performance apparel looks and feels like. Um, it definitely has a different aesthetic than what exists in the market. And I think we're being, you know, people are paying attention to that. Let me uh, ask you one more question, then I'll turn it back to Don because he has some more questions he wanted to ask you. I'm curious okay. with with that explosive growth. Have you seen competitors come into the space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the men's athletic apparel market. I, I like to joke that when we first showed up um, to the there's an athletic apparel trade show um, held on on the West Coast. Now they have both West and East Coast versions of it. But when we showed up the first year, there was, we were one of two men's brands in the whole place. So all the women's brands, if you wanted men's apparel, they would just point them towards us and be like, go talk to Viore. And it was amazing. But it was also, you know, the, most of the focus in the, in the space was on the women's market. Now we show up and, you know, maybe there's 10 to 15 brands. So we've seen a lot of people come into the category because they're recognizing there's such an opportunity in men's. And, um, you know, we're just really fortunate to have been on the front end and really tied up a lot of the premier distribution that we wanted um, kind of early on um, before before uh, the competition gets there. Has the competition influenced your price points? No, um, not competition post-launch, but when we – you know, identified our brand positioning and our, um, kind of where we wanted to sit in the market at the beginning. We did look at the competitive landscape and, you know, look to what the mainstream athletic brands were doing. We looked to kind of what some of the outdoor brands were doing. We looked at what Lululemon was doing and, you know, kind of we saw an opportunity there from a pricing standpoint. So that, that did play a big role into how we set our prices and still does to today. Good. Thank you. Don, back to you. Oh, a lot of questions. Uh, good questions. Uh, uh, we're, ch- we're talking with Joe Kudla. Uh, the, your website again for our uh, audience, Joe? Yeah, it's vioriclothing.com. That's V U O R I clothing.com. Okay. Um, uh, just so I've, uh, I'm clear, you, uh, you sh- you're primarily in the men's athletic uh, marketplace. Am I correct? We launched the business with a focus on men's because we thought the men men's active market was very underserved. However, since launch, about um, a year ago, we started introducing women's products on a very select basis, um, and that did very well, and it organically has grown into um, us being a multi-gender brand. So we offer men's and women's currently. Hmm. That's really interesting. So, uh, again, uh, just so uh, – uh, I, I understand and um, help our audience. So you focus in provi- providing um, a short th- that makes it um, more comfortable for uh, individuals engaged in sporting activities. Would that be correct? That is correct. Shorts, but shorts is just one of many things that we make. We make t- T-shirts. We make um, jackets. We make. Um, hats and accessories we make pants uh, but but our jumping off point and i would say that the, the area that has really accelerated our growth and where we've gotten known for is our shorts so yes exactly that is very correct well that's why you're on the program because uh, someone um mentioned your shorts to us and we uh we looked into it and we think you're an up-and-coming brand but um, but now having uh, said that how have you financed your growth well, we started out by raising a little bit, you know, it's kind of the initial money was founders. And then we did a, some friends and family rounds. We've done two rounds of friends and family. And um, then we were fortunate enough um, to, to reach profitability early on. And we've 
developed a great relationship with our bank and um, we've got some debt financing. Um, and that's, that's it. That's our cap table is pretty clean. And, um, you know, we, we, er, we implemented discipline, profitability discipline early on in our business because we didn't want to have to go out and, and attract a big institutional partner, um, early on. And so we, uh, we've been fortunate to, um, you know, have a model that's generating a lot of positive working cash flow. Hmm. So uh, if I understand, uh, you started out uh, uh, as e-commerce, you've opened your first uh, brick and mortar and, and you're about to expand. Did I hear that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And your next shop is going to be in San Francisco? Yep, that's we're working on a store in San Francisco right now. Hmm. Um, uh, uh, my wife happened to have been a CEO, a COO of Haynes uh, uh, T-shirts, uh, Haynes Clothing, and she uh, she discovered an interesting fact when there that um, uh, over sixty percent of all uh, uh, underwear is brought by women. Is that the case with you? With your uh, brand, we definitely feel that the tr- we're no exception to the trend that women control most of the purchasing decisions in the household. And um, so, while while women do shop a lot for their men in our brick and mortar stores, we find that our online customer is predominantly male driven. So we find that guys are buying for themselves on our website. Uh, that's very interesting. That goes. That's uh, different uh, than most of the. Uh, data that uh, people have been saying about e-commerce. But having uh, said, said that, why do you think that is the case? It's a great question, and I do not want to act like I have the answer. Um, you know, I think that that men are more willing to shop online because it's a quick experience. If you, you know, we back everything that we make with a product guarantee and very simple return. So we we have what's called our investment in happiness product guarantee, which means if you're not completely happy and satisfied with your purchase, send it back to us. We'll pay for the return shipping, and you can do that anytime. So where where I'm a month, two months, if it's not meeting your needs, send it back to us, and um, we'll make sure you're taken care of. And so I think for men, you take the risk out of the equation, and it's a it's a much easier experience. They don't have to go drive somewhere, park, walk in, try things on. Um, and so I think from an online standpoint, men are more open to shopping. And then what we've definitely recognized with men is that they're not as they're not actively engaged in discovering new brands and new products. Um, but they're, so they're harder to attract in the first place. But once you get them, they're much more loyal customers than, than their female uh, counterparts. Hmm. Well, um, uh, the uh, thing I've been interested in is, is how do you pick the colors, and is, is are, are the choice of colors uh, different by male and female? You know that's a great question. Typically, that is the case, and we, you will see some variation in color between our between genders for Viore. Although we try to stick to a very um, kind of modern and and more wearable um, color palette that can work across genders, and um, so that's I think a a little bit of a product, a, a differentiator for us. Um, but, um, you know, as far as how we pick colors, we're just very in tune with what's happening in the marketplace. You know, we look at the trend forecast to see kind of what colors are trending. But while we're mindful of trends, we, we don't necessarily um, always abide by them because we, at the end of the day, we want to make product that's not um, ultra trend driven, but it, it really spans the um the test of time and it's product that will be relevant today and it'll also be relevant. You can pull it out of your closet in three, four years and, and wear it and, and look equally good. And, and so we're, we're, we try to, we pride ourselves on not being slaves to trends at the Well, I have one more question and back to Dan, but what's your price point? How much does one of your shorts cost? So our entry level price point for our athletic shorts are $68. Um, we have some shorts that go up into the 90s, but our but our base level, which m- the majority of our shorts offering is at, is in that high 60s. Um, for women's, that um, comes down into the 50s, and um, for athletic t-shirts, um, you're in the low to mid 40s. 
and um, we have some hoodies and jackets that run up into the low 100. But for your shorts, uh, I'm sorry, your your uh, a short uh, the average price or the uh, uh, entry price six sixty eight dollars. Ah, oh, okay. Um, Dan, it's back to you for the final two questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm curious as to the decision to go from e-commerce to bricks and mortar when the whole retail industry is looking to get out of bricks and mortars and you can you can almost buy them all for nothing. What, what, yeah. what car do you decide to want to go in bricks and mortar? Well, uh, that's a great point that you bring up. And um, what where we're finding um, brick and mortar retail to really be struggling is at mass. Um, we believe that uh, retail is just way overbuilt in kind of B and C markets across the United States, but um, class A great retail is still doing very well. It's just, um, there's just too much, there's just too much retail um, built in the United States. And so if you can pick your battles and, and choose great locations, um, you know, for us, it's not about shopping centers and malls, but it's more about um, street side locations near where our customers live and, and hang out. And, and go for exercise. Um, we want to be able to connect with consumers to create a great experience. So, you know, your multi-brand retailers, maybe they operate off of a low 50 kind of margin profile or initial margin profile. Whereas, you know, when you're running a direct to consumer business, um, you can operate at higher margins, which gives you more opportunity. And it, it means your occupancy doesn't need to be such a low percentage of your total sales because your margin profile is better. So, um, right. you know, for us, for us, uh, brick and mortar retail is a great way to connect with customers. It's a great way to showcase your brand and give people an, an experience of, of kind of what you stand for and what you mean. Um, and, um, and, and, and just connect with more people. So we, we really love um, brick and mortar retail. For that reason. So, I think you said you work with REI. Yeah, correct. REI is a great and their partner. model is not in shopping centers. There's at least from what I can see around the country, their model is freestanding stores. Um, is that is that where you, are you in shopping centers or are you freestanding stores? Well, we're in. We do um, uh, business with third party wholesalers that are in shopping centers, um, but. I guess what I'm defining as kind of shopping centers that are really struggling are, are your big malls and right. you know some brick and some brick and mortar kind of wholesalers that carry multiple brands and don't have their own in-house brand. So what I'm saying, where, where when we look to, I guess what I was addressing in my previous comment was more so um, our own Viore branded retail stores those we really like because those we can control the experience better. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then from third party wholesalers um, from that perspective, we're just really particular and, and just make sure we're doing business with great partners that are willing to invest in kind of presenting the brand properly, telling our brand story. So we would rather do business with less wholesale partners, but make sure that we're doing business with the right ones that are committed to uh, the partnership. Um, if that makes sense. Yep. Thank you, Joe. Back to you, Don. Well, uh, we could go on and on w w with Joe Cudler. Joe, your website again? It's vioriclothing.com, and that's V as in Victor, U-O-R-I, clothing.com. Hmm. We have been talking with Joe Cudler. A link to his website will be on recalculating.biz tonight, where you can hear th this show and every other past and future recalculating show. You can also tell us via a short survey uh, what what more you'd like to hear from Recalculating Radio. Joe, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, guys. It was great talking to you. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz. I want to tell you about Bob Bethel. Bob's new book is Strengthen Your Business, Fail-Proof Strategies for Small Business. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. Bob Bethel's book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. Dan Perkins with your featured book. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2HSA.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. 
HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit cost. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2HSA.com. That's 2HSA.com. You know, Dan, before we go any further, I, I want our audience to know about your new runaway hit book on uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease and how it affects teenagers. Please tell us about it. Yeah, Don, thank you. The book is called Why Can't Grammy Remember Me? Uh, it's a book written primarily for for children ages 9 to 12, but really needs to be read by the entire family. So you can buy it at Amazon.com, and or you can order it through your local bookstore or any online bookstore besides Amazon has it available. Why Can't Grammy Remember Me? Illustrations are spectacular. A story by Dan Perkins. Your runaway bestseller new book, Why Can't Grammy Remember Me by Dan Perkins. Dan, when I was growing up, they had lots of jokes about the relationship between men and women. In today's business world, a joke can be dangerous. There's a terrific new book out by Jennifer Crittenden called, and I love this title, What's a Guy to Do? How to Work with Women. She's here now to talk about it. Jennifer, welcome to Recalculating Radio. Thank you so much. Well, before we go further, Jennifer, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to write this book. Sure. The um, the impetus for this book actually was based off of my experience writing my very first book, which is called The Discreet Guide for Executive Women, How to Work with Men. And I wrote that book after I'd worked in corporate finance for over 20 years, and I noticed that a lot of my female coworkers would drop out in their early 30s. And I felt as though they often were discouraged by the environment in which they found themselves. And I had learned a lot during my years about working with men and working in male-dominated environments. And I wanted to share uh, what I thought could be helpful advice to women who were looking to build a career in a environment that was probably new to them. So I wrote that book in 2012. It was fairly well received. And it's like lots of other books out there. We have tons of books with advice for women about leadership and uh, growing your career and so on and so forth. It wasn't until the Me Too movement happened this past fall that it suddenly hit me that we we really don't have very much advice for men about how to build a culture that is welcoming to all kinds of people, women, minorities, and so on and so forth. And that in fact, the, as you say, the stakes are now very high for making a mistake. And because the atmosphere has become so charged, people run the risk of making a mistake when we really haven't done the right thing. We haven't explained very well uh, the ways in which you can behave, which would be helpful to other people. So that was my impetus for writing the book. Okay, but uh, before we go further, your website and how people um, can get your book and uh, tell it again, tell the title again, which I love uh, for people. Sure. So my website is discreet guide. D I S C R E E T G U I D E discreet guide dot com, and there uh, the your listeners can learn all about me and my first book, and also about the new book. Well, okay. Well, well, uh, you're, you're talking to two uh, two people who um, uh, have uh, in their time were both uh, experienced. Uh, uh, people in the business world, and I, for one, ha- um, ha- am having great difficulty adjusting to this new world because I've always treated women as e- uh, as equal partners, never called them babe or anything, yet mm-hmm. uh, see people, um, uh, see men, con- uh, f- forget about the Harvey Winsteins of the world. I'm talking about people who uh, uh, simply do not... Uh, 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 are being uh, uh, gas- uh, 
uh, eliciting anger, let's put it that way, for such things as looking cross-eyed, which happened at the Lowe's recently, to um, uh, pe- uh, people who inadvertently bump into uh, women. Just found, found about, out about an incident over the weekend uh, here in New Jersey. And uh, it seems to me we have gone way overboard on this issue. So I'm going to start with a um, a loaded question. Have we gone too overboard? <laughs> the good thing about the Me Too movement is that it has brought attention and focus to the plight of many women who are suffering at the hands of powerful men. The unfortunate thing that's happened, and I think this is common when topics, sensitive topics like this come into the public eye, is that the pendulum then swings, you know, in one direction. And so you have men who are accused of pretty minor infractions, if you even want to call them that, who are suffering pretty severe consequences, not just to their professional life, but also to their reputation. That obviously is a big problem. We still need to have due process. We still need to have people who are accused of things have the opportunity to defend themselves. And one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I felt as though common sense has a bit gone out the window here, that all of this spectrum... (laughs) <laughs> this spectrum of behavior from really egregious, you know, you mentioned Harvey Weinstein, that's just, that's just criminal behavior, to things that are more like accidents or, you know, just a reflection of lack of awareness or insensitivity. We shouldn't have the same um, punishment for this whole range of, of behavior. So I'm really hoping that with my book, I can, we can start having an adult conversation about men and women working together and really for us all to participate in this so that it's not so vitriolic and accusatory. I, I do think that we've gotten to a bad place. Oh, you, got, you came to the right program. I'm going to ask one more question <laughs> and turn it, turn it over to uh, Dan, but I – what uh, can you give us quickly one or two or three things in your book that men um, should be aware of or or um, should do to avoid some of these issues? Sure. What's uh, been interesting to me is to have a number of men read my book who consider themselves woke. You know that they're already. Um, pretty aware of the challenges that women face in the workplace and for them to come back to me and say, you know, there's stuff in your book that I wasn't aware of. Um, So I'll give you one kind of um, subtle example. I think a lot of times when men find themselves working with a woman, they attempt to morph the relationship that they have with her into a different relationship that they have with a different woman. So you might think, oh, I should treat this person like my mother, or I should treat this person like my daughter. And in fact, a professional relationship is different from both of those. So you're in fact developing new ground when you're learning how to have a professional, as you mentioned before, equal relationship with a woman that you work with. So it's kind of a subtle thing, but it's an easy trap to fall into. I would say at the other extreme, the most common complaint that I hear from women is that nobody pays attention to them at work. They're not valued as somebody who might have a serious contribution. And sometimes they're treated as though they're in the way, or often they're treated just as though they don't exist at all. So they speak up in meetings, nobody pays any attention. They try to make recommendations, and their recommendations aren't taken seriously. I think it's very common for us in our society not to value what women have to say as uh, much as we do inherently with what a man has to say. And we constantly have to work on ourselves. All of us have to do that to remind ourselves, hey, Am I being a little bit sexist here? I need to consciously make sure that I'm valuing the input from my male colleagues as I am from my female colleagues. Uh, Dan, I'm going to take it, turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Don and Jennifer. Welcome to the program. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm not 
ashamed to say that I'm not the most politically correct person in the United States. Here, here. But I want to share with you um, uh, something that happened last week that um, you may have heard of, but it in, in talking about it, it's it's going to um, put your book at risk. There was one of the largest social media companies in the world introduced a new policy last week that no employee could look at another employee for more than five seconds. And if it was more than five seconds, it could be treated as harassment. So I listened to what you were saying and I listened to the last conversation that you had with Don where you were talking about women uh, complain that they don't be they're not taken seriously well if a corporation puts out a human resources policy that you can't look at a, another person for more than five seconds at a time how are you going to change things I think companies are reacting in very strange ways and uh, let's step back for a minute so remember when it became required to conduct sexual harassment training? That was a compliance issue. And companies, instead of embracing that as an opportunity to sensitize people about what sexual harassment looks like or even what, what it means to make your colleagues uncomfortable looks like, they treated it as though it was a check-the-box training they conducted um, online training with no conversation or discussion, and, and no surprise, employees treated it like it was just a problem to get through, to slap through those slides, take the exam at the end, done. And we can see now sexual harassment training was a failure. And I think when companies take this kind of um, hard-nosed, uh, we're just going to regulate things. We're just going to put rules in place. It doesn't work. People are much more complicated than that. Is it okay to look at somebody for 10 seconds? Absolutely, depending on the relationship that you have with someone. Is it wrong to look? Can you make somebody uncomfortable by looking at them at all? Yeah, probably if you already have a history of, of harassing that person. So these attempts to break things down into black and white are really in my opinion, misguided. There's another example of a company that is encouraging its employees to tell on each other if they know something about somebody. That's also extremely misguided. My goodness, how can you possibly have a productive, trusting, happy environment in which people are working well together when the company is subtly encouraging people to rat each other out? It makes no sense. So I do think we're seeing some reactions that are really inappropriate. And again, I'm really hoping with my book that we can reintroduce some, some calm and some common sense and really understand what the important things are. And I'd just like to mention for, um, for your listeners, for people who are trying to build a culture, especially a small business, I think it's important to think about why you want to have a, a, a culture which is welcoming to people. Right now, I don't know it is where you are, but right now in San Diego, the employment market is red hot, the hottest I've ever seen it in decades, which means that retention is huge. Holding on to your current employees is really important. And so one of the ways you can do that is by having them want to stay, right, to, to want to be at the company that they're at. So I emphasize this, the importance of culture, not, not strictly because of regulatory or, or legal reasons, but because it's smart business. Well, Jennifer, we, uh, another example of perhaps a good idea gone bad, and you, I'm sure you're aware of it, is the, quote, sensitivity training where Starbucks closed every one of their branches 
to try and put together a program to help their employees to be sensitive about race and religion and, and sexuality and all those things. Um, and uh, their intentions may have been good. Uh, their execution, from what I'm read about what the employees thought, is exactly what you talked about a few moments ago. Let's get through this, yeah. get through the slides, and then move on to whatever else we're doing. So that, that um, here is a major company that thought there was a problem and thought they had the solution we're going to close all of our stores and put everybody in mandatory sensitivity training. And um, it, it got um, mixed reviews at best from the employees. And uh, their intentions were probably good. Execution is poor. Now, um, I, I have to ask you this question, and that is um, – do you believe that all of these things that we've been talking about, the training program at Starbucks and the five-second rule uh, at, at the major social media company and more, what was the role of women in management to accomplish those things? <laughs> Let's talk about the Starbucks training for a minute. I'm so glad you brought that up, and I watched that with – of course, great interest because um, clearly it was well-intentioned. I think that they had a public relations problem. They thought that they could address it um, by doing some employee training, which is really great. But the outcome of that, as you say, was mixed at best. And one of the things that struck me as I was reading the reports from the employees who went through this was just the tone deaf misunderstanding about the different cultures that they have in their different stores. That a New York Starbucks is way different than a Missouri Starbucks. And that the people who are interacting with each other have completely different issues because of that. I think that's one of the benefits that owners of small business have is that it's a much smaller culture. And so you have a better understanding of what your people are facing. Starbucks, this huge corporation, I mean, my gosh, their workforce is in and of itself hugely diverse. So to try and do this, let's just slap a Band-Aid on this thing and call it good by taking a couple hours off and doing this kind of generic sensitivity training for all these incredibly diverse people who are facing very different problems across the counter from each other. It, it, it was, you know, you just wonder what were they thinking, right? How, how could they have made such a, such an obvious mistake? Right. In my view, it would have been much better for each manager of each store to sit down with his or her staff and let's talk about the problems that we're having because this is real. We, experience, we all experience these things. We have the same customers coming in. We have the same problem in, uh, customers. We have the same challenges coming in off the street. Let's talk about that. You, wonder, you have to ask yourself how much of this is for the purposes of PR and how much of it was really for the purposes of making a difference. And, of course, I don't know that, but it does raise a question in your mind. Uh, so it's, to it's, get to, it's a good question. So to, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt you. So you've asked about the role of women in um, the decisions. In, yeah, in making decisions about how to go forward. And if there's one thing that we've learned is that women don't uh, possess the silver bullet for this. And I don't see the the proof, I would say, that by bringing women into the conversation – about diversity or sensitivity training or sexual harassment training that that solves all your problems because i think women suffer from the same biases that men do and so we've learned that that it's not as though women have this magic uh way of solving these kinds of problems they're just like everybody else so, again, this is one of the things I really emphasize in my book is you guys have to come into the conversation with us. This can't be just up to women to solve these problems. This has to be 
an adult, mature conversation amongst experienced people about how we're going to make it so that our workplaces are happier places. Because fundamentally, that's the problem, is that many employees are unhappy at work. Right. And we, we, I think we have the tools now to figure out how to make them better. We're just not there yet. Right. I'm going to ask you one more question, then I'll turn it back to Don. Um, it was interesting to me that within a reasonable period of time, after the sensitivity training at Starbucks, the executive chairman retired. And I wonder if the reaction to what had taken place created an environment where he could no longer believe that he could could do anything for the company. Do you have any thoughts on that? I hope that's not the case. That is what I would say. It's not... We don't want to have a situation in, pe- in which people are losing their jobs or being pushed out or even so discouraged that they drop out. That's a huge loss for us because imagine how much experience that person has and how much they could contribute to a conversation going forward. So I think it's really not right for us to say, oh, we're just going to get rid of these bad apples because I don't think they really are bad apples. I think we're all apples all in this together, and we're trying to figure out how to solve the problems that we have unearthed and that have been there, frankly, for decades. Don, back to you. Oh, uh, you know, uh, Jennifer, I I could go on and on with this one. (laughs) Yeah, me too. Dan and I met on another program, and I have already written to that program to invite – to invite you to be on it because uh, um, I, everything you're saying is uh, so right on. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll give you another instance. Uh, my wife is a Harvard MBA, smarter than nice. me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but the point being, if we go someplace and if we're, we're talking to someone, they'll, that person, will, whether male or female, will inevitably – Talk to me, and not to her. And, and uh, you know, it's it's something that that uh, um, it's at times gets very frustrating for her. Um, but it's part and parcel, I think, of this. Uh, uh, despite the many years of progress women have made in business, it is still a, still a, a male-dominated conversation. How do you get around that? I'm glad you brought that up. That's uh, also another common complaint from women, and I talk about it in the book. Not only do sometimes the men prefer to talk to other men in the group, but they'll assume that the men are the most senior um, uh, executives when, in fact, the woman could, in fact, be the most senior person in the room. So there's always some awkwardness, right, that comes with that, with these assumptions that, that are made. I I, ha- I have a lot of female clients um, that I coach, and one of the things that I encourage them to do, and I'm sure your wife has done this also for many years, is to let small things slide. And I think that is one of the areas in which it's really okay for a while to just listen to the conversation. And then when you enter the conversation, you can make it clear that you've been listening, that you have a lot of education, and that you have something to contribute. And I think holding back is really okay. I think then when you come into the conversation, it wakes the other person up to the fact that, oh, here's somebody to reckon with that I didn't realize had so much to contribute. I think we have to be kind to each other, that that men have – sort of an immediate trust with each other that they don't have with another woman, with a woman, I should say. And we need to understand that there, that there could be a good reason that they choose initially to talk to a guy. It's harder for them to, um, it, uh, to forecast how the woman is going to take their comments. So I think there's, there are social reasons not necessarily discrimination reasons that they might choose to talk initially to a guy. You know, it's funny. I I have to tell you uh, something that happened to her. She was CEO of 
uh, Haynes Brands, a, a group of other brands down in North Carolina, and um, a professor came in to ask for a grant. And when he walked into the room, he gave my my wife the uh, uh, she was a senior person in the room. He gave her the uh, papers uh, uh, for her to copy, so he could hand yeah. it out to the people. <laughs> yeah. So, oh yeah. <laughs> And, and those things still happen, unfortunately. We, yeah, I know it's but, so awkward, isn't it? Well, she, what she did, she went out and she xeroxed them, and then took took her place at the head of the table. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, but it's very anyway, subtle, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that's a subtle way of communicating. You've kind of we, just made a mistake, but I'm not going to embarrass you for it. <laughs> but any, anyway, uh, Dan, we, we only unfortunately have time for just one more question. I'm going to let you have it. I'm curious as to your thoughts about where the Me Too movement is going and can it survive? I, I've been asking myself this question because we're seeing a huge number of accusations being made, but the reality is in the courts, It's, in fact, quite difficult to get a um, judgment against somebody. Historically, we've seen that. The bar is pretty high. The sexual harassment behavior, if it's not um, a quid pro quo, if it's not that you either sleep with me or you lose your job, those are pretty cut and dry. If it's that we've made a hostile workplace, those are hard to prove. And so I'm somewhat concerned that we're flooding the media with all these talks about people being accused when, in fact, they're not going to hold up in court. So what's the outcome of that? Now you have a lot of women who have put themselves out there publicly, and they're going to find that they're going to lose. So I think it it all remains to be seen how this plays out. In any Hmm. case, I, I think that it's, I think that the time is right for us to not talk so much about what's in the media, but what, to, but to talk about what's in front of us today so that each of us can work on this problem each day in our own environment. Super. Thank you. Don? We have, been, we have been talking with Jennifer Crittenton, author of What's a Guy to Do? How to Work with Women. Uh, I strongly recommend the book. Uh, Jennifer, uh, how can people uh, reach you, your website, and everything else? Yeah, sure. So uh, my website is discreetguide.com. Discreet is D-I-S-C-R-E-E-T, guide, G-U-I-D-E.com. And I'm very easy to find online, and I'd love to hear from your listeners. I think this is part of a conversation that uh, we should be having, many people should be having, uh, so I'd love to hear from them and hear what their experiences are. I, I don't think Dan and I uh, w- would disagree with you. Um, a, w- a link to the, this web uh, to her website will be on uh, t- tonight on recalculating.biz, where you can hear all of our shows, past and future. You can also tell us via a short survey what topics and ideas you would like recalculating radio to explore. Jennifer, thank you so much for being with with us. It's been a, a real pleasure. For me, too. Thank you so much. Marcus Limonis, J.D. Powers, and John Scully, and a hundred other presidents and experts contributed to recalculating the book. Why did all these people agree to contribute to the book? I'm Don Mazzella, and I'm the editorial director of Small Business Digest. And for 20 years, we have been offering small business leaders information and data to increase profits. Recalculating the book was named the best small business book by the Independent Press Association. Whether you need help with marketing, staffing, finance, operations, technology, or many other subjects, they're all here in Recalculating the Book. They're now available at Amazon at a reduced cost. We've also created the radio program on Recalculating.biz. 
Thank you for joining us on Recalculating. We hope the information you received on today's episode was helpful to you in starting and growing your business. Please go to our website, recalculating.biz, to contact us, to listen to past shows, and see special offers. Until next time, remember, if you grow, we grow. Join us next week for more helpful ideas to make your business a great success. Recalculating, a program designed to help you be successful 